just few quick words to start. Uh, of course, I'm not Hassan Selim. He will come. He is with Menahem upstairs, uh, trying to understand where we are. Uh, I'll leave the, ch uh, the chairing role to him when he comes. Uh, oh, this is our last uh, panel. It's uh, a comparative panel, actually, on energy conflict and cooperation. Uh, we will focus more on Persian Gulf and South China Sea. Uh, or first speaker, uh, uh, would you like to, Yoel, would you like to speak first uh, as you had uh, time constraint? So please, uh, uh, Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Ram Shaoli from the Trum Truman Institute on Southeast Asia and the regional quest for energy resources. No, I'm, I'm, well, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, uh, Yoel, <laughs> Arab Gulf state. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak uh, about uh, oil uh, and border disputes in the Arabian Peninsula and in the Gulf uh, region, uh, with some reference uh, to what was mentioned earlier in the last panel. Uh, some say that the Arab Spring uh, did not arrive uh, in the Gulf, uh, with the exception of Bahrain, of course. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a mistake. It did arrive. But the monarchies uh, so far, the six uh, Gulf, six GCC countries, managed to, uh, and I, I, I underline so far, to either buy opposition from within and uh, uh, buy support uh, from outside. Uh, if we can do the connection to oil prices, the monarchs need high oil prices in order to continue and satisfy the demands of the opposition, and I mean uh, high oil prices, uh, $80, $80 a barrel, $90 a barrel, these are the budgets of, of the Saudis and others, and if you see uh, the oil prices go down, they'll have uh, a problem. But the importance of access to energy resources in the Persian Gulf is not new. According to the latest BP, British Petroleum Statistical Review, which is the most uh, uh, 48% of total proven oil uh, uh, reserves and 41% of proven uh, world gas reserve are in the Gulf. With all due respect to the East Mediterranean, the Gulf is still the most important uh, in that regard. And will we'll continue to be an arena of regional and international conflict, I'm sorry to say, enhance a central factor in the security of the region and beyond. Most of the Arab Gulf states, uh, the exception of Oman, are a product of the 20th century with borders, particularly those of the smaller states, drawn largely by outside colonial forces. The formal delimitation of international borders became increasingly pressing once oil was discovered in the Gulf in the 30s and 40s uh, concession were granted, territorial values rose, and the possibility for vastly increased income from natural resources became more fully understood. You have a map behind me. I'm sorry, it's a small map. Uh, if you have more detailed questions later, I will uh, be glad to show you. Uh, many border demarcation, however, uh, in the Gulf uh, were conducted bilaterally between Britain, who in practice conducted the foreign policy of many of the Gulf states until 1971, until left the Gulf, and the state gaining uh, independence. This not excludes those neighbors that shared the border issue, but the boundaries determined were often based on vague temporary demarcation, such one example, the uh, a contract between Britain and Kuwait was based, this is a quote, on the southmost palm tree. This is how they uh, uh, demarcate borders back then, and it arose uh, problems later on. And the problems are uh, four main problems. Because of the ambiguous and bilateral uh, uh, agreement, uh, because uh, combined with aspiration for control over oil and gas fields in border areas, and because of the difficulties in determining boundaries in desert and tribal regions, and the fourth, the historic rival rivalries and political interest uh, between the GCC countries. 
And the result, because of those four uh, elements, many borders have remained till this very day uh, in disputes. And when I, when I talk about the Gulf, I mean the Arabian Peninsula. I don't talk about disputes between the GCC and Iran, Abu Musa, the islands. I don't talk about that. I talk only about disputes between the GCC uh, uh, countries. Although the majority of disputes between uh, the six have been settled on paper, the disputes themselves or connected issues uh, to border and oil issues continue to rise from time to time in the Gulf. These ongoing and generally bilateral territorial disagreements have not only prevented the GCC as a union, some say is a sort of an alliance, alliance, alliance minus, from attending to crucial matters unrelated to borders, but has cast a shadow over the ability, over the ability of its member states uh, to cooperate with one another. The failure of the pan-GCC pipeline, if you know the Dolphin Project, the famous Dolphin Project, first proposed in 1988, in part because of border issue, is still on hold. And this is a, a prime example. Such territorial disputes have yet, at least in recent years, led to a serious armed conflict, excluding a few in instances that turned violent. Uh, for example, two years ago, uh, it wasn't uh, that public, uh, a ship a UAE ship fired at a uh, Saudi vessel, uh, capturing the soldiers, injuring some others. Uh, and over a water, they were disputed uh, because of oil interest uh, in the border between the two countries. Uh, it is likely that uh, severe escalation is prevented because it remains in the interest of the royals, of the six uh, rulers, to avoid an actual war whether because uh, the financial cost of it and the political implication that would arise. The border themselves uh, and actions that undermine their legitimacy and create minor or major incidents are also part of the nation building process uh, in the Gulf. Uh, in, order, in other words, I have a border conflict, therefore I am. These disputes assist in cr crystallizing national identity that is based on raising conflicts from the past in order to give historical depth to the country and clearly determine the other. As such, border conflicts and oil disputes can also be used by new leadership as a way of defining their rule and obtaining support among the public. Although territorial disputes can help leaders to form a sense of common purpose, uh, the establishment of external threats, it also has the potential to create high expectations of greater governmental responsibility among citizens. This could prove problematic for monarchs who have established authoritarian type uh, system. The fact is that territorial disputes in the GCC are not isolated issues. They are often, as noted, used as a tool for increasing domestic support raised and pursued in order to achieve political goals, but also at, at times placed aside or pushed toward resolution in the face of external threat and common interest. It's not a secret when there's uh, an uh, outside threat and it's true for the GCC, you see them more uh, uh, unite and it's true for the Arab Spring as well. Uh, I have studied the major uh, inter-GCC disputes, that is those, especially those between Qatar and Bahrain, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and the UAE and Oman. Uh, I can later go in details of exact, what are the exact uh, disputes. Both Qatar and Bahrain have disputed ownership of the Hawar Islands and some other reefs between the countries, what pushed the two nations to disputes was Bahraini exploration of waters near the territory uh, of Qatar, which suggested the possibility of oil and gas uh, uh, deposits. Qatar and Saudi Arabia have disputed over a piece of territory that extends 25 kilometers east of uh, Khawar al-Udaid, sometimes also referred as the Khufus region, uh, which provided Qatar with its only land corridor to a state other than Saudi Arabia and to the oil-rich sea uh, near its uh, borders. 
UAE and Saudi Arabia disputed the Boremi Oasis, today uh, the city of El In, very beautiful city, a territory in uh, dispute since the 19th century among tribes from Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the UAE. It sits on the borders. Uh, the enormous field uh, there has potential reserve of about 20 billion barrels of oil and 25 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Although mostly resolved on paper, inter-GCC border disputes and related concerns have certainly not remained dormant. Uh, the signing of agreements, even in international forums, uh, like the agreement between Bahrain and Qatar, who went to The Hague and uh, was decided there uh, because the country couldn't decide themselves, does not exclude the possibility of states bringing up issues directly connected to borders. In fact, border disputes serves as a multi-use tool. They assist in establishing a country position in relation to its neighbors, reinforcing national identity, and generating support for the leader, who may also use such disagreement to define his role. Oftentimes, it's not clear what causes the rift. Is that oil-related border concerns? or political disagreement manifest themselves in border disagreements. Regardless, they have negative impact on both GCC image and the ability to successfully function either as a form for conflict resolution or the establishment of a framework for collective security uh, and, uh, has been demonstrated. Bycots of meetings as a result of bilateral territorial concerns and the necessity for outside mediation have occurred on more than one occasion, calling into question the possibility for increased unity on even or even successful cooperation on non-territorial issues. Qatar refusal to sign an inter-GCC security uh, agreement until 2009 show the extent to which border disputes and concerns can affect the organization, the GCC activities. And as the UAE rejection of the monetary union in 2009 as well, for example, has shown issues surrounding boundaries uh, remain uh, an obstacle uh, uh, to unity. Just uh, an anecdote, I, I was in the UAE a few years ago and I bought a map. Uh, uh, and if you buy the same, if you buy a map in Saudi Arabia, those maps uh, don't relate to one another. Some of the territories in the UAE, the Saudi consider them and in the, in the map you buy in the UAE, you see some Saudi territory belong to the UAE. They don't, uh, 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 they don't uh, go together. New leaders in the Gulf, uh, such as uh, Amir Tamim in Qatar, and who may be the successor of uh, Sultan Qaboos in Oman, may choose to utilize such conflicts in order to define and distinguish their role and increase their popularity and support among the population. If internal stability will be further questioned in the Gulf, it's a big if, the leaders could uh, look to those disputes as a means of gaining support. One, once that happens, territorial disputes are liable to be removed from the back burner uh, to the front. However, it tends to be less important after the Arab Spring or with the Arab Spring uh, process, it tends to be less important as to whether the citizens accept the current border than whether they accept the regime that is responsible for drawing such boundaries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kuzaski, for your insightful presentation and excellent timing. Now, uh, we will uh, listen to Mr. Dr. Rand Shaoli. Uh, Rand Shaoli is currently working research fellow at the Truman Institute uh, for the Advancement of Peace, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He teaches courses on Southeast Asia, the Chinese diaspora, and collective memory at Bar Ilan University. Uh, now uh, he will make a, a presentation uh, on, I suppose, Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> okay, I will try uh, very briefly to give you a picture of um, the uh, energy consumption in Southeast Asia, energy, energy production, energy distribution, and I will also try to relate to 
some issues that arise from uh, these problems, that is issues of cooperation between countries that are basically in conflict uh, or in a potential conflict. Okay, just to remind us where we are, this is Southeast Asia, which is located conveniently at the center of the world. Um, these are uh, the countries we talk about, uh, that is um, uh, east of India, south of China, north of Australia, though I think that Australia should also be included, and uh, um, uh, west of the uh, Pacific. Uh, there is something about the terrain in Southeast Asia which is um, a historical determinant and, and it matters for, for our discussion here today, and that is the fact that Southeast Asia is uh, divided by uh, in Sorry? is divided by uh, by sea by water. This is one thing, and another thing uh, that divides is is uh, our insurmountable ridges and mountains uh, covered with with, with rainfalls, which means that historically and also today, states and uh, and uh, pre-modern polities uh, have always developed in the basins of of, of great. Um, great uh, rivers like the Mekong here, like the uh, Chao Phraya here, like the Irrawaddy, and like the, uh, um, the, the, red, uh, the Red River, the Hongkhe. So we're talking about very diverse and very, um, and, and, and a place which is divided by, by geography. And we should remember that. We all should also remember that there has been a population change. You can see it here. Also, there is, uh, there has been a change in the distribution, uh, the global distribution of wealth, and Southeast Asia has its part in it. Just to give you a feel of it. But still, most of Southeast Asia is poor. You can see it from this map, and you can also see that the Human Development Index is relatively low in most of Southeast Asia, save for little, uh, the little Emirate of uh, Brunei Dar es Salaam and um, and uh, and uh, the city state of Singapore, and uh, also. Uh, uh, relatively uh, speaking, we could, we, could, we could also talk about Peninsula Malaysia, but generally speaking, this place is still poor, still underdeveloped, uh, and it is part of the South, By uh, and everybody agrees about that. Um, you can see uh, also that there is a, di a diversity within states. Here, HDI means, on the right-hand side, Human Development Index. You can see that uh, Burma or Myanmar on the right-hand side is very low, and Singapore is upscale, but in the middle you can see uh, all the differences. I will not go uh, into the nitty gritty of, 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 of uh, um, analyzing all that because you're tired and we don't have the time. Uh, that's a good excuse. Uh, energy consumption and demand. Okay, let's start with that. Um, it's okay, I, I, I will give you enough time. So first of all, th this is how uh, the world looks like from the outer space. You can see uh, that uh, uh, the most developed uh, areas are lit by night, and this is uh, the way uh, Asia looks at night. Please, uh, you can see here that the most uh, populated areas in Southeast Asia and uh, the, uh, the urban centers are located in uh, either uh, along the, uh, the shores or in, as I said, in the, the, uh, the great basins of, or in the lowlands and the great basins of the rivers. Um, People not, uh, do not just use electricity, they also um, use uh, fuel for transportation, as you can see, and they, there is also um, a development in uh, industry. So, still, more than 130 million people do not have access to electricity. This makes investors very happy because they see, oh, we have an opportunity uh, for money to be made. But this is not just... Uh, just part of the story, not the whole of it. You can see, uh, we, we would nicely say that these people are using biomass fuels for cooking, household cooking. Now let's talk about the energy demand, uh, the future is. Energy demand in Southeast Asia has expanded by two and a half times since 1990. Its rate of growth among the fast is among the fastest in the world. The IA, that is in a, uh, sorry, uh, a neocon, um, international, uh, no, not just me. Uh, uh, okay. 
an agency, International Energy Agency, they foresee an increase of 80% in the next uh, eight years, depending on the tripling of the region's economy and growth of the population by 25% in the next 20 years also. There will be growth in coal, natural gas, and oil demand. So this area will become the world's fourth largest oil importer behind China, India, and the European Union combined. I mean, Southeast Asia combined. Oil import dependency will almost double to 75%. Spending on net oil imports will triple to almost uh, to, uh, 240 billion in uh, 20 years' time, equivalent to almost 4% of the GDP of all these uh, countries in uh, Southeast Asia. Thailand and Indonesia uh, uh, spending, these are the, uh, the strongest uh, economies in the region, spending on net oil imports will triple to nearly 70 billion each. Global oil supply uh, will uh, had risen to a record high of uh, 90 uh, million barrels per day. Uh, that, that, sorry, that, that has happened in the past, of course. And as I said, uh, 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 130 million of about 600 million do not uh, have uh, access to electricity yet. So when you look at the uh, grow, uh, GDP growth rate, we see that Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, uh, Philippines, and the Philippines and Thailand are the fastest growing. We can also look at uh, uh, the uh, estimates of uh, future uh, urbanization and see that there will be more consumption of fuels. Uh, just look at uh, this uh, highlighted uh, part of, of the table. Um, this means energy per GDP, which means if, if you take one unit of the GDP, how much do you invest, uh, how much energy do you invest in order to develop, okay? To, to make it simple. And the more, the less, the less you invest, the more efficient your development is. And you can see here that uh, it varies, varies uh, very much between countries. Uh, for instance, uh, Vietnam <laughs> is uh, a, a very efficient, and the Philippines are not. Why? There are various reasons, which, uh, to which again so we, we don't have the time to uh, we don't have the time to discuss. Uh, same thing about electrification rate, uh, motor vehicles in the population, and. Uh, this is uh, one of these truisms. Uh, when you are uh, better off, you use more electricity. This is how I would sum up this uh, this uh, 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 this graph. Um, energy indicators, primary energy demand. We have uh, a, a past of growth and a future of further growth. What kind of growth? Not just growth of use of oil, but also use of Coal and gas. Gas is uh, and coal are uh, very popular uh, fuels in Southeast Asia. So this leads us to uh, uh, give you a picture of the energy supply. Uh, as you can see, natural gas uh, accounts for 44 percent of uh, uh, of uh, 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 the total use of of, uh, of fuels in Southeast Asia, which is uh, comparing to, to other. Uh, Parts of the world, a very good, a very good number. Sa same thing with uh, with coal. Total energy production. You can see also uh, that uh, 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 coal and gas are, are widely used. Um, do we? Th uh, uh, what about a, um, a future dependency? Uh, we have something like t 20, 40 years. Some say even 80 years if we use coal uh, to go. Th there will be no crisis. This is. Um, this is what people say. Uh, now, who are the producers? You can see uh, that Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand are uh, the biggest uh, producers of, of crude oil in the region. Uh, Indonesia uh, ranks number 23, and Malaysia uh, 28, and so on and so forth. Natural gas production, Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, th this is the global, uh, this is the global uh, table, of course. Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, number 30. Main energy producers, uh, oil, Malaysia, Indonesia, Myanmar, coal, Indonesia, Vietnam, gas, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, hydropower, Myanmar, and Laos. Oil reserves, as you can see, uh, are not very promising if we are talking about cheap oil. Of course, uh, at the sea there's plenty of oil, but uh, it costs more, more money to, to, to produce. What about energy shipping? Uh, the Malacca Straits, which are... Um, the gate to the east and the west are uh, located here at the middle. Uh, this is uh, one of the busiest uh, uh, maritime routes in the world, and uh, uh, of course, uh, everyone is afraid that should something happen like a, a, 
a big uh, a big tanker uh, uh, will sink, uh, mm -hmm. the prices uh, of oil will rise, and what shall we do then? Um, as you can see, one third of all seaborne oil passes through the Malacca Straits, and if the uh, super tanker is too big, uh, they can go through uh, Sunda or Lombok. That is. Uh, uh, these passages in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, more than half of the global uh, liqu uh, liquid uh, natural gas trade passes uh, through here as well. And uh, the thing is that these traits, uh, historic and also today, are, um, are a very dangerous place. So, the Chinese and the Americans both want to bypass this, uh, uh, these dire straits. Okay? So what do they do? Uh, the Americans, um, uh, the French and the Americans, Total and Chevron, uh, just to remind you that Chevron is one of the sponsors of President Obama, uh, were uh, building a pipeline that uh, passes through the Kra Isthmus, uh, east to west, and bypasses, um, uh, uh, bypasses the Straits. The Chinese are building their own, um, their own pipeline here, uh, and uh, of course, they're working with the, the Indians and with the Koreans to do that. Uh, hopefully, the, for them, they will finish by June this year. Um, but this is, we're not talking just about, um, about pipelines. We're talking also about people. Um, and uh, you see, uh, these uh, pipelines go through uh, places where, the, where there is conflict. Why? Because as uh, we said, there are many peripheries, uh, political and, ge and, and, and geographical peripheries in, in Southeast Asia where the control of the state is very minimal. Highlands, okay? Places where the state is not, influence is, is not that strong. So uh, these are, I won't go into uh, explaining each and uh, every one of these, but they are there. And as you can remember, uh, uh, guests from Turkey know that picture, I guess. Uh, what happened here in, in this area, in, in this area, numbered one, uh, where uh, Ro Rohingya Muslims were, uh, were uh, there was an attempt for, for an ethnic cleansing uh, of, the, uh, of the Muslims by, by, the, uh, by, the, um, by the Buddhists, uh, uh, Rakhine Buddhists uh, got uh, publicized all over the world. And uh, this is from November, uh, the Holocaust Museum, uh, uh, Washington DC, uh, has a new, um, a, new uh, a, a, a new show of pictures about the plight of Burma's uh, Rohingya. Uh, two minutes, okay, so I'll, I'll be very, very quick. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is a matter, a matter of, of, of uh, passing oil through uh, conflictual areas. Uh, has got uh, also the attention of, of, uh, of Barack Obama in his, in his visit last year, and uh, referring to an event that happened just um, just uh, four, no, three weeks ago, I think. Um, the Chinese also have an eye on the region, and this is why they, uh, not just because of, 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 of uh, these troubled waters, but also because of the bypasses I was talking about, the Chinese are also concerned about that. Now, just to, to, to finish with this, uh, China and Thailand are turning Laos and Myanmar slowly but surely into uh, hydropower houses. It means that um, m all of the new dams that are being built uh, up the river uh, in these countries uh, are oriented into serving the uh, energy markets in, in these uh, nations, in, that is in, in Thailand and in China. And this uh, raises a, a new question of uh, electrocolonialism. Also, a project of sharing power through a, a cross-border uh, power grid, the Asian uh, cross-power grid, uh, has not yet developed fully because, and this is uh, the point, because cooperation without some amount of justice, and this is my argument, which I and I don't have the time to develop, does not work. You cannot uh, secure miles and miles of, of pipelines and, and high voltage uh, 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 power cables just using military force. Okay. <coughs> I, I have more to say. Forget about it. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I'd like to present you Dr. Christopher Pokariar. Uh, he is a visiting researcher at the Truman Institute until March 2014. He is a professor of business and government governance in the School of International Liberal Studies at Waseda University, Japan. Uh, his uh, research uh, his interest area, areas of interest are economic nationalism in a number of contexts. Other research interests uh, pertain to the internationaliz internationalization of universities and so-called nation branding. And today uh, he'll make a presentation on 50 years of lessons, Australia's management of international and domestic resource po politics. Thank you very much. Right, well, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'll, um, because we're not gonna have time really for much discussion, I'll just uh, make my one reaction to Michal's presentation, which I thought was excellent. Um, the, the diamond is one powerful metaphor. The other one is the, the arc of freedom. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about the arc of freedom is that the, seat, that the arc starts in Tokyo, that it, that it arcs through Australia, uh, very much via India and uh, Turkey, and goes all the way to the European Union. And that's the essence of the Abe vision. And we see that recently with uh, uh, Shinzo Abe being in uh, Istanbul. So that's a promising scene. Um, my presentation is going to be uh, a little, dip little different from everything else that we've had so far because what I'm seeking to do is really look at 50 years of the Australian experience of being very much a resource, increasingly resource dependent economy and to draw some basic lessons not just about how it changes the relationship between Australia and other nations but, but maybe more fundamentally from an Israeli perspective how it actually changed Australia itself. So the takeaway lessons on what happens when you become more resource dependent. And I think the Australian parallel is, is a critical one for uh, Israel because Australia is obviously a mature and knowledge intensive economy, striking parallels with Israel. Um, but also because in, in a fundamental sense and maybe in a critical or in a positive sense, Australia is a settler society like Israel has been and a critical factor in a successful, prosperous settler society is a transfer not only of, of human resources, but of course the capital resources to support development. Now in terms of the Australian foundational story, uh, resource developments, resource findings, and this is minerals rather than, than energy resources, uh, are a critical factor of the early story. Uh, simply put, the gold rushes. Uh, we had like the, like the Californian gold rushes. In a positive and a negative vein, the gold rushes are critical to the Australian development story. Large sums of people came but increasingly large numbers of Chinese pro, uh, prospectors as well. So both the origins of Australian prosperity and the historical origins of Australian racism can be directly uh, traced back to the gold rushes. Um, subsequent stories of development, moder modest energy and coal and minerals exports until the 1960s. Uh, then from the early 1960s, we see an explosion in terms of investment in resources and particular export. Uh, iron ore is, a, is, is the hugest one, and we'll see that in a moment. Coking and uh, steaming coal, later on bauxite for alumina and varied minerals, and then the next wave, offshore natural gas. And uh, to flag where I finish, there's a critical Australian angle on Israel's uh, impending decisions about how it develops its own resources. Uh, there is a, uh, an agreement in place that gives the Australian firm wo uh, Woodside a 30% option uh, the critical question is the price and also Woodside's expertise is in liquid natural gas and exporting to Asia. Depending on the decisions that Israel makes about how it develops its field, uh, it has a significant impact on the price Woodside is prepared to pay and, and be involved in the project. Uh, a simple point about the way resources can change a society. This is Australia's industry mix in 1960. I won't talk all through it, I just simply want to point out um, the figure for mining, in 1960, mining contributed 1.8% to the Australian economy. Uh, agriculture, 11%. Manufacturing was nearly 30% of the Australian economy. A simple summary of the Australian economic history was Australia, Australia had strange animals and strange economic policies, historically. Uh, high levels of protectionism throughout the, the first half of the 20th century with completely open foreign investment policy. So by 1960, two thirds of Australia's manufacturing sector is foreign owned which also, in an interesting thing in terms of debates about foreign investment, 
When it's foreign owned, it's also easier to let the industry die. And that's something that's often lost in the discussion. Skip forward to 2012, what do we see? The mining industry now is worth 10% of Australian GDP. Uh, the rest of it tells the story of the sophistication of the Australian economy. The fourth largest export is actually higher education services, for example. So simultaneously, we uh, reverted to being a kind of a primary industry-centred economy. Uh, the historical image of mining is that it's just basically people digging holes and exporting. The truth is, in, uh, and this is reflected in, in the capital intensity ratios of these industries, they're very knowledge intensive and capital intensive industries, but they're also primary resource uh, intensive. Important things about what uh, resource development does in terms of your economic relationship with the world. Critical for Australia, it multi multilateralized its relationship. Historically, Australia was a tale of British settlement. Uh, until 1924, no foreign loan had been raised uh, by an Australian entity outside of London. So critical dependence on Britain. What we see in the 1960s is the development of the resource export trade entirely towards the growth economies of East Asia. Uh, it's no accident that with the growth, the growth of the first resources uh, trade exports to Asia, Australia also abolishes its white Australia policy. And this is a critical defining thing in Australian politics in the mid-1960s. The 60s and 70s, the capital mostly came from its traditional markets, the UK, the US, uh, but the product went to East Asia. Increasingly, East Asia themselves became more prosperous. They became very good at financing these projects, at contracting for these projects, and taking strategic stakes in them. Um, by the late 1980s, we see Japanese FDI is the most significant in this, uh, but it wasn't particularly controversial. Chinese FDI in the Australian resources sector is particularly controversial because of the dominance of state-owned enterprise explicitly backed by Chinese government of securing long-term supply. So in a qualitative sense, the experience of Japanese foreign investment in Australia is widely perceived as very different from Chinese FDI. And even the most liberal uh, in Australia have significant doubts about a completely open foreign investment regime in relation to China. Um, and right to an hour in the midst of a free trade negotiation with China, so it's difficult. The scale of this. Um, my, my uncle was an academic specialist in offshore oil and gas exploration. Um, he, the university treated him so badly, he went and became a freelance consultant. He's now a multimillionaire as a result. He told me when I was very young, the difference with the mining industry is when we talk about money, we add an extra zero and sometimes two zeros. And this is true. Um, these are just the scale of Australia's exports. Iron ore is the largest. Uh, this is an older figure, actually, 12, uh, 2002. The iron ore trade, export trade itself, is worth $60 billion a year. Okay? Um, coal is another $60 billion. Uh, Australia is becoming a more significant LNG exporter. Um, that's relatively small stakes for Australia. It was only about $9 billion, okay? So in any one year, just uh, coal and iron ore alone contributes $120 billion to the Australian economy. So, so this is an astonishing impact by anyone's um, measure. The consequences, of course, we see a rise in resources exports. Um, the net effect, and the takeaway lesson on this, is Dutch disease is a reality. Uh, I started my career basically in universities, being a specialist in marketing, marketing Australian universities abroad. My daughter goes from Japan abroad next year. I'm sending her now, I'll probably send her to Stockholm because it is now cheaper than studying in Sydney. Uh, uh, Australian services sectors have lost their competitiveness because the appreciation of the Australian dollar, but it's only partly an appreciation story. Australia basically in a decade became Scandinavia by accident in terms of its domestic costs uh, through the enormous resources boom that we've had. And this is going to be one of Israel's greatest challenge. A um, couple of quick observations. The holy grail of Australian industry policy was always downstream processing because Australia has both minerals and it has energy. And the dream was put the two together and you've got massive value adding. In practice, downstream processing is normally environmentally horrendous. Um, and the failure of many of Australian uh, projects there pleased many environmentalists. You know, if you see the air in China, you'll understand some of the uh, concerns. Where it does work, it's enormous fixed costs and enormous investments in infrastructure, bringing the energy and the resources together. Israel doesn't, doesn't really have that particular challenge. 
we do have the environmental impact challenges, the infrastructural challenges, and of course the governance and political economy challenges, and that's what I briefly want to talk about. Um, I'll make these slides available on my website. That's just at Ficaria.com. You can find that. You can look at it yourself. Um, simple point is, and this, this is a critical point, the resources trade has an enormous spatial impact on your economy. Um, particularly in the Australian case, it's huge, but the, but the vast majority of the Australian population lives in six cities. Uh, but the resources are not in the cities, they're in remote areas. So this has had a very big impact on local Aboriginal communities, on decentralisation and whatnot. Every single one of those larger dots is a billion dollar project, by the way. Um, so the spatial effects are significant. This is not an issue in Israel, profound issue in Australia. We have a federal system. We, we mirrored the US system of combining states together. Western Australia and Queensland have grown enormously wealthy at the expense of other states because the royalties regimes for mining are vested constitutionally in the states. The attempt of the feds, the federal government, to capture revenues has twice been politically disastrous for, for governments. The Dutch disease effect of diminishing the competitiveness of other sectors is serious. So what are the challenges? The sheer capital intensiveness, the money involved. You need efficient financial markets. This is absolutely critical. And we see that those countries that have been able to combine resources and efficient financial markets have prospered. This is part of the South African story as well. The long-term contracting is significant. Because of the money involved, no bank will lend for a project unless that you, you can walk into the bank and say, well, I've got a 20-year contract with Mitsui or, or, or a, you know, a Japanese or a Korean or whatever buyer to raise the money. And there are interesting issues of buyers taking equity stakes uh, as part of a sign of commitment to the project, but also getting intel as a result. Uh, another takeaway lesson, um, capital intensive industries, once the projects are built, they don't employ many people, but they employ them uh, very profitably. And we know this is the, uh, the Norwegian effect as well. So in fact, despite this enormous boom in Australia, we've only really added about 100,000 full-time jobs once the construction process actually actually finishes. But the royalties and whatnot, which flow, of course, contribute enormously to a sense of um, prosperity. Like all capital-intensive industries, and I, I teach business, so I guess I'm kind of focused on this, all capital-intensive industries are subject to hold up. That's why airlines are subject to strikes. Um, any industry which is time-sensitive, capital-intensive, and few staff means you are plagued by hold-ups. You're also plagued in the project development phase. Um, my brother is an architect, he quit his architectural office, he went and became a labourer on a mine site, um, he didn't even need to complete year 10 of high school to do that, he earned three times the salary he got as an architect. Okay, this is the reality of the mining industry. What it also means is that, and it's a, it's a rule of thumb in the mining industry, nothing ever gets built to budget. It doesn't happen. It massively blows out. Um, it's also cyclical. It's naturally a cyclical industry. Because of the capital intensiveness, uh, there's a run-up in demand, undersupply, prices surge, a flood of investment. Everyone invests at the same time. Basically, there's a whole bunch of unproductive projects or unprofitable projects that are closed. People leave the industry. And another critical thing is that people who work in the industry, particularly because of its remote nature, um, when the industry downturns, they leave. And so there's always labour shortages, and then you've got to build up those shortages again. The distributional issues, very briefly, um, some of the people who do best out of a resources boom are lawyers and accountants. Uh, they become a significant political force uh, in bilateral agreements. If you go to any meeting of the Australia-China Friendship Society or the Australia-Japan Friendship Society, it's overwhelmingly accountants and the lawyers uh, who are working for, um, for clients in the trade. Uh, if you mess with the big mining companies, they will screw you politically. Uh, Kevin Rudd, Rudd lost the Australian Prime Ministership in a clumsy uh, introduction of resource rent tax, okay, um, as a simple takeaway thing. Uh, export permit regimes get complex, as we understand. Um, and a final small point, but I think a very interesting one for Israel. If you have foreign investment restriction regime, foreign investment regimes which want to preserve uh, the assets for the nation, what this often means is that wealthy local entrepreneurs get uh, world-class mining assets at below world prices. So that you actually can, by giving into economic nationalism, create a, a class of ultra-wealthy domestically. Uh, and so it's an important role for journalists and analysts. Um, I'll skip this other than to say that foreign investment regimes in general are always case-by-case case and discretionary. 
And if you ask for governments to have more transparent policy, it often ends up being less liberal. And that's a kind of a counterintuitive thing, but a simple take. Um, on international relations, the conclusions are inescapable. Uh, you build strong domestic constituencies uh, for your customers. Uh, we've seen that in Japan, Korea, um, and uh, China, but it's more contentious. Uh, Australia has built a very strong relationship with Japan through the resources trade. I'll skip through some of this. Um, on making peace, uh, Australia doesn't ha really have border disputes, except for one with Timor-Leste, the, uh, you know, the new independent state of East Timor. Uh, but there's a very generally a fairly positive lesson that we can learn here. Learn here, and this actually was a precedent from in Indonesia. Uh, Australia and Indonesia agreed to not talk about the border for 35 years, and then they extended to 50 years, and they agreed through an agreed formula to develop it, to develop the resources on the condition that no one raised the border disputes. So you don't need to resolve the border dispute if there's enough money in it. And I think this simple lesson. Can a, it can apply in the South China Sea, it can apply in so many simply pla sim places. You say, look, let's leave this to future generations when, when the, uh, the pain of history has faded, okay? Let's get on with making money. And that's what we saw there. Um, just a little bit on gas, finally, because it directly relates to a range of issues you've got here. Woodside is backed by Shell. Shell has this very interesting new technology on floating um, liquid natural gas platforms. Uh, there's interesting questions about if a project becomes unviable, can you pull up the anchor and move the, uh, the platform to another site? So is there a secondary market for the processing? This significantly reduces the argument for onshore LNG infrastructure. And that's, that's a real threat to Cyprus's interests, I think, if we, if we look at that. A um, couple of other very quick, quick things. Um, and this is the payoff from having a reputation for being a stable location and being able to raise lots of capital. What we see is Australia's planned expansion of its LNG infrastructure in this case um, means that it goes from being a fairly large player but half, less than half the size of Qatar to leapfrogging, to being far and away the second largest supplier. Um, that coupled with uh, what we know, and this shows here, uh, just how the world can change so quickly. This was the two and a, 2005 forecast for US imports of LNG. By 2011, it was d basically revised to zero, all because of shale gas, okay? So we're seeing massive extra capacity coming on out of Australia with new platforms that can be redeployed in other places. We've seen a, basically the collapse of US demand, um, and that really fundamentally feeds into the big decisions that you have to make here in Israel about whether you seek to serve European markets or whether you shift towards the Asia Pacific. If you do invest in very expensive fixed LNG onshore infrastructure geared towards East Asian markets, you're going to have a lot of competition uh, from Australia. And I'll just, just simply show here, uh, all of Australia's LNG has been going to East Asia. Uh, the stuff that was going from Qatar used to go to East Asia, increased demand from Europe, saw a lot of it switch across to there. So uh, you know, people are quite savvy in switching in response to price signals. Um, the final thing I'll say, uh, a guy in Australia, Ross Garno, uh, former ambassador to China, wrote the most influential report on Australia and Australia's engagement with East Asia. He's forecasting that Australia may have switched from the salad days, the great days of the most recent China boom, to the dog days. This is where China reorients its development <coughs> model, less um, energy resource intensive, and Australia has to get back to being productive again. We've been there before. Australia kind of knows how to do this. This is what we did in the 1980s with the process of reform. But the critical thing is, in this, with, when you become very dependent on a secular, indus uh, secular industry, it entirely depends, your national experience depends on the quality of your political leadership um, and the quality of your corporate leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pocarier. Thank you for reminding us the importance of paradox plan of plenty. Yep. It's not about having uh, hydrocarbon resources, but how you engage with them when you have an economy and how you use them uh, to cool down your inflation rates, etc. Because it has some uh, other impacts on uh, the other sectors. Uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, actually, uh, according to the schedule, uh, we have two minutes. <laughs> uh, we have to close down the session, but 
uh, I suppose uh, this session uh, deserves to take some questions because it's not something conventional that we hear from the panelists. It's about South Asia. Uh, so if you have uh, questions, please uh, pose them. Uh, we would be happy to answer, I suppose, as we have a strong panelist group here. Yes, if you want, I'll have a question, but <laughs> Doctor, do you have a question? Uh, just a little question from the uh, side. Uh, I want to meet you in Israel and India. Uh, uh, sorry, yes. Just a quick question to uh, pr uh, Dr. Tanhum. Uh, the relations between Israel and India, uh, I think there is a deepening relations between two countries. Thank you, Kavanj, for an answering that. I actually hope that uh, Shinzo Abe's arc of uh, democracy will reach all the way to here if it's successful. Um, India and Israel have very, very strong um, relationships that are, are deepening. Uh, Israel is one of India's uh, largest arms suppliers. First, uh, the relationship developed um, with uh, weapons technology, uh, which gives uh, India a very strong edge. Um, but it has blossomed into many other things. So, for example, agricultural technology, uh, our Israelis are very good at micro-irrigation, water drip, uh, clean energy technology. Um, so they, that is all developing. India, as you know, has been in kind of an economic slump. However, the India has several different states, a few of which are actually at uh, double-digit growth rates, and Israel has very strong and developing relationships with them. So the relationship is growing, but at the same time, in Israel is always looking at uh, India and China, because China is also a, uh, a growing uh, partner. Um, but... Um, Traditionally, India has been very afraid of alienating its own uh, Muslim constituency, which is 20% of the population, many, many politicians, uh, and also alienating Muslim countries because they need their support uh, or at least to blunt their support for Pakistan in the Kashmir issue. So that's been a little, a little bit of a problem, but the relations have been growing at quite a geometric rate. Um, India is having defining elections in, in uh, 2014, September 2014. Uh, so far, the opposition candidate has tremendous momentum, and he's quite controversial, but he's also quite popular. Um, it will mean a paradigm shift for India. It'll mean India will be much more pro-business. It will mean if he wins, India will cut bureaucratic red tape, and India will assert itself more in the international realm and not try to do it simply through multilateralism. This opposition candidate is also one of the few Indian, major Indian political figures. He, he's for over a decade been the chief minister of the state of Gujarat, one of the leading economies of India, uh, states of India. He himself personally visited Israel. So if he is elected, um, we can expect um, an even stronger relationship. If he's not elected, it still means India and Israel will develop their relations uh, further because they have very strong strategic interests in common. But if he is elected, the entire tone, which is very important, will change. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Pokaria, uh, does Australia has a resource fund or not? Uh, do you think that, what do you think the, the uh, main essence behind uh, this problem of uh, service sector or other sectors losing importance in the economy? Is it a nominal uh, loss of importance or relatively they are losing their importance in the economy? Thank you. Okay, um, Australia didn't have a fund such as in the uh, Norwegian case. Uh, one of the reasons for that is just the sheer, well, it's a, it partly it's a federal thing. Uh, the control of resources, particularly the way British law works, um, even if you own the house freehold, 
if they find oil in, in your backyard, uh, you only own the first 30 feet or something down into the ground, okay? They have to, uh, they, they, they have to compensate you for digging up your swimming pool to, to pump it out, uh, but effectively all the resources technically are uh, vested in the state, in the crown, but they're allocated by the state, so, so the federal government could never come up with anything. Uh, there was a number of years back a future fund created just before the financial crisis um, when, when Australia was one of the very few countries in the world that actually ran public surpluses. Uh, and they started buying shares and various things. Very quickly, the government raided its own future, future fund, <laughs> um, and that's fallen into a certain disrepute. I mean, the critical thing in Australia, and, and uh, this, it, it relates fundamentally to what we've been talking about the last day and a half here. The, Australi the Australian government's policy has always been that it does not intervene in commercial transactions. It, uh, very significant thing it did with Japan right back in 1975, was to say explicitly to commit to Japan, we will never use our export controls, for example, to, to ever intervene in pricing. Uh, so explicitly a hands-off, and that's been a powerful positive thing uh, in terms of winning the confidence of private sector investors, and they've never wanted to mess with that. We've been talking for the last day and a half, instead of catalyzing peace processes and regional change, by using the resources trade. So, so it's a world away in some sense. Um, you have to understand, as soon as you make your resources sector an object of politics, uh, investors become wary, and these are very capital-intensive sectors. Uh, so that, that would be my broader takeaway lesson. Um, as for the impact on other sectors, um, yeah, it's, it's basically kill manufacturing, uh, simply put, but the manufacturing is mostly foreign-owned. Uh, we are publicly watching the painful death of the Australian car industry right now. Um, in probably three years' time, we've got four car, three car manufacturers now, one assembler. We'll probably only have Toyota in three years' time. Um, so Ford's basically packed up in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's a huge issue for things like the Australian higher education sector. Um, Australian universities, year in, year out, gave great wage rises to their staff and the assumption that we'd have hordes of Chinese students and others. Now they're not coming. Um, so, but um, and the, the business person in me says that, uh, you know, it's, it's a cliche, but it's a truth. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the metaphor of the taut economy, that it's in tight times that you have to force yourself to get more productive. Um, and that's the process we're seeing now. That uh, it's even if the boom times do continue, periodic periods of doubt that about the boom is very important for people to, to become more efficient in the way they use resources. So, yeah. The flip side, of course, is uh, if, if the, uh, the, wap the, the tap of resources is welded permanently on in the mental mi mindset, no one cares about productivity and efficiency anymore. And that, that's a very scary thing. Uh, Chris, I have a question for you. Um, and then if, you, if it's out of your area, um, there's one uh, energy resource that's been critical for the world that we haven't talked about yet, and there's a massive worldwide scramble for it, especially big competition between uh, India and China, and that is for uranium, for nuclear energy. And um, Australia is one of the world's largest suppliers, probably second or third. It's Austra Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan, Canada, and Australia are the world's top suppliers right now. A little bit, maybe Niger. Um, so, how does that affect uh, Australia's economy and also the politics, given uh, all the implications of nuclear energy? Uh, that's actually near and dear to my heart. I used to be very active in the Labor Party when I was young in Australia, and the the divisive I divisive issue, uh, other than Israel and. Israel and Palestine, I was in the right and we were all pro-Israel, um, was uranium exports. Um, yes, uh, we, we have a, a three mines plus policy basically, three established mines, but they're so big and we've got these proven reserves. Um, you might, um, you know well, uh, the Australian government did a very significant thing. It, uh, it announced, it, it basically has, has uh, allowed uranium exports to India. This is a very significant thing. Uh, the Australian policy has been very strict in, in terms of monitoring and safeguards. Um, I like to upset my, f upset my friends by saying we should give some uranium to Israel, and, in and the people say, are you insane? Um, the Australian government clearly uh, can't do that. Uh, we know the history of issues of getting uranium from South Africa and whatnot for um, uh, various purposes here in Israel. Uh, it's uranium is relatively small in terms of its, it, the size of its exports, dwarfed by so many other things. Um, it, 
historically was politically significant because the left made it very politically significant. Yeah. I have to close the session here. I'd like to thank uh, our panelists first, then to our audience who followed the uh, panels from the beginning up until the end. So everybody deserves a big applause, I suppose. Thank you very much for coming. And I think it's turn to thank our chairman, who uh, very fortuitously came in place of someone who couldn't do it, and thank our panel for reminding us how terrific always a comparative perspective is. We always, as, as scholars, so occasionally forget it, and uh, this session, I think, has been terrific in the broader plan of the conference. And uh, I want to close with our chairman, thanking all our guests from abroad, thanking uh, all our speakers, the guests to Truman, and let me single out two thanksgivings to our academic committee and uh, its leading spirit, Kivan Ulusoy, uh, Andreas Stergio, and Professor Moshe Maoz. And the biggest hand and most thanks to Adam Hoffman, who made it all possible. Thank you. And candle lighting is in turn, everyone in his home. Chag Sameach, happy holiday. <laughs>